Welcome to History Shorts Forgotten War Stories Month. In light of the 80th anniversary of D-Day, I decided to dedicate the month of June to highlighting some astonishing, bewildering, and sometimes just downright forgotten stories from the war's past. We finished the month with the little-known stories of the Civil War. If you have a comment, you can find us at www.historyshortspodcast.com. You can also follow us on Facebook at History Shorts Podcast for daily fun facts and much more. If you are enjoying this podcast, you can support the show by leaving a review wherever you listen, or you can support the show on a one-time basis by buying me a coffee at buymecoffee.com forward slash history shorts podcast. Following the secession of southern states after the election of Abraham Lincoln into office in 1860, the American people were not quite ready for the carnage that was soon to follow. For many, the taste of what was still to come happened on July 21st, 1861, when Washingtonians set off to the countryside near Manassas, Virginia, for arguably the worst picnic in American history. I am your host, Peter Zablocki, and this is History Shorts. The Civil War began after the secession of southern states and the attack on Fort Sumter in April 1861, with both the Union and Confederacy eager to assert dominance early on. The Union, under the leadership of President Abraham Lincoln and his military advisors, aimed for a quick, decisive victory to crush the rebellion. General Erwin McDowell was appointed to lead the Union forces in the direct march to Richmond, the Confederate capital. The Confederacy, on the other hand, aimed to defend its territory and force the Union to recognize its independence. Generals B.G.T. Beauregard and Joseph E. Johnston were tasked with defending Northern Virginia. On July 16, 1861, McDowell's army of about 35,000 men marched from Washington, D.C. toward the Confederate forces near Manassas Junction. Despite delays and logistical issues, they reached the area on July 18th. Beauregard's force of about 22,000 men was positioned along Bull Run, with additional reinforcements under Johnston arriving from the Shenandoah Valley near the Manassas Gap Railroad. On July 21st, McDowell launched a flanking maneuver attempting to cross Bull Run at Sudley Ford to surprise the Confederates. The Union forces initially pushed back the Confederate left flank, but then the Confederate reinforcements arrived in the afternoon, including brigades led by the famous Thomas J. Jackson, who earned the nickname Stonewall for his steadfast defense. The Confederate counterattack overwhelmed the Union forces, and the poorly coordinated Union retreat quickly turned into a chaotic rout. The problem lay, sometimes quite literally, in the throngs of spectators dressed in their Sunday best, resting on the fields surrounding the battle so as not to miss any of the grand spectacle. At the outset of the Civil War, many in the North believed that the conflict would be brief and relatively bloodless. There was a widespread assumption that the Union forces would quickly crush the Confederacy, and since the first battle was to take place near Manassas, Virginia, just 25 miles southwest of Washington, D.C., the close proximity to the capital made it that much more accessible for civilians. On the morning of the battle, hundreds of civilians, including politicians, journalists, and families, traveled from the capital to the battlefield. They came in carriages and wagons, bringing picnic baskets, blankets, and other supplies, as if attending a social event rather than a military engagement. The mood among these spectators was festive. Many saw this as an opportunity to witness a historic event and celebrate what they assumed would be a decisive Union victory. Early in the day, the Union forces seemed to have the upper hand. This likely reinforced the spectators' belief that the battle would end swiftly in their favor. But, as the battle progressed, Confederate reinforcements led by General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson turned the tide. The Union troops, unprepared for the intensity of the Confederate assault, began to retreat. I saw the 12th New York Regiment rush pell-mell out of the woods, commented one reporter. Soldiers everywhere threw down their weapons and ran from the battlefield, sweeping up civilians in the retreat. Among the crowds of the onlookers were a handful of U.S. Senators toasting, to the perceived Union victory. Then suddenly, from the not-so-distant battlefield came soldiers, horses, and wagons. Turn back, turn back, we're whipped, Union soldiers cried as they ran past the spectators. Startled, Michigan Senator Zachariah Chandler tried to block the road to stop the retreat. 
Senator Ben Wade of Ohio, sensing a disastrous defeat, picked up a discarded rifle and threatened to shoot any soldier who ran past him. While Senator Henry Wilson distributed sandwiches, a Confederate shell destroyed his buggy, forcing him to escape on a stray mule. Iowa Senator James Grimes barely avoided capture and vowed never to go near another battlefield again. The senators returned to Washington with gloomy faces, as one reporter noted, where they delivered eyewitness accounts to the stunned President Lincoln. One member of Congress, New York Representative Alfred Eli, made it to Richmond that day, albeit as a prisoner of war. Although apart from one suspected case of death by being trampled, the civilian spectators were actually largely unharmed. Still, the experience shattered any remaining illusions about the war being a short and bloodless conflict. When the dust settled, the Union suffered around 2,896 casualties, while the Confederates had approximately 1,982 casualties. Leading newspapers like the New York Times, Harper's Weekly, and the New York Herald sent correspondents to cover the battle, and their detailed articles and illustrations brought the stark realities of war to a broader audience. Harper's Weekly, a popular illustrated newspaper of the time, published dramatic engravings depicting the battle and its subsequent retreat. One of the most famous illustrations showed panicked civilians and soldiers fleeing in disarray, often referred to as the Great Skedaddle. The embarrassment of the whole situation was hard to avoid. Renowned illustrator Thomas Nast, known for his vivid drawings, also contributed to the public's perception of the battle. His work portraying the Great Skedaddle did a great job showing the confusion and terror experienced by soldiers and civilians alike. The immediate portrayal of the battle's events, particularly the sight of civilians fleeing in panic, starkly contrasted with the earlier romanticized view of the war. The defeat galvanized public opinion in the North, leading to a surge in enlistment and support for a more vigorous persecution of war. In the Confederacy, reports of the victory at Bull Run were a source of immense pride and morale. The Southern press highlighted the success as evidence of the Confederacy's military prowess and the righteousness of their cause. On August 28, 1862, and one year after the Battle of Bull Run, or the Battle of Manassas, as it came to be known in the South, the Confederate Army once more met their Union counterpart in the very same spot. And much like what happened the first time around in Virginia, the South, this time under the command of General Robert E. Lee, secured another decisive victory over their North, commanded by Major General John Pope. This time around, there was no wealthy elite sitting on a nearby field watching the battle. Lesson learned. Thanks for listening. Hello everyone. My name is Tom Kearns and I host the Anglo-Saxon England podcast, where I cover the history and culture of England from the departure of the Romans in the 5th century to the Norman Conquest in 1066. So far we've surveyed the collapse of Roman rule in Britain, the migration of the Anglo-Saxons, and the history of Northumbria from its beginnings in the mists of legend to its destruction at the hands of Viking raiders in the 9th century. I hope you'll come and give it a go.